the bridge if we come to it, but... Now, now, look, listen, you've got to be brave and strong, darling. That's what Chris needs you to do. Now, we'll find a way to get you home. In a moment, the silence at song's end is our afternoon drama. First, here's Vincent Duggleby to tell us about Moneybox Live. Striking a balance between the interests of landlords and tenants is never easy, especially as demand for rented property is buoyant and it's getting more expensive. Disputes can arise over repairs and maintenance, health and safety, rent arrears and withholding deposits. So what are your legal rights, especially if you rely on housing benefit, and what impact will the so-called bedroom tax have on local authority tenants if your home is judged to be too big for your needs? You can call Moneybox Live on 03700 100 444 with your questions about renting and letting. Lines are open now and the programme starts after the three o'clock news. That's 03700 100 444. Now the afternoon drama is The Silence at the Song's End by Nicholas Heine, introduced by the late author's mother, Libby Purvis. The morning runs on, springtime secret through the avenues and avenues which lure all sound away. I sing as I was taught, inside myself. I sing inside myself when wild moments slice some tender evening like a breeze that rattles gravel and digs in the dirt. I couldn't sleep in late on those summer mornings, not for weeks afterwards. I woke up with the sun, got up quickly before I could think, and went over to your room at the end of the barn. You once said that your goal was to write something you could show to somebody. Apart from schoolwork, you never did show it. But here, in this quiet room, it turns out, is a mouse's nest of papers and post-it notes and old exercise books and logs of your sea journeys on the square rigger across the Pacific. I think I'll type out what you wrote. Not to pry, mothers shouldn't ever pry. I suppose all I want to know is what you saw. What were you looking for? Everyone deserves that much attention. Actually, it says so right here in one of the notebooks. What is important is to remember that it is not the way in which we record our existence, but that we do record it. In the air and everywhere around, we must remember how the streets ring out for every soul that thought and felt and passed through them in weakness and in strength. You don't think of small children as poets and philosophers, but looking back, you showed the signs early. Four years old, and the 87 hurricane brought down an old beech tree behind the house. You cried, and you said, I will be dead before it can grow up again so beautiful. But then, in the howling midnight darkness, you told your baby sister, Rose, do not fear, no stranger comes. It was as if archaic, iambic melancholy was your natural medium. And the sea mattered early on as well. On the family boat, you'd creep out of your bunk to keep a night watch by the helm with us and see the shapes of the sails against the stars. I sing inside myself the one wild song, song that whirls my words around until a world unfurls my ship's new sail. I catch the dew and set a course amongst the ocean curls. The silence at the song's end, before the next is the world. Nicholas Paul Heine, born 1982 on the rising tide in the British Hospital for Mothers and Babies in Greenwich. You were named, although we didn't know it at the time, after the patron saint of sailors and scholars. And yes, you were always good at words. Sometimes that alarmed us and your teachers. Once in a nervous phase at ten years old, you said about your school... Even the bricks in the walls are curling themselves up to throw themselves at me. 
And here's that same image again, years later. You must have been seventeen or so when you wrote this. Bad trip. While lying waiting in the shimmering cold, it was as if the bricks broke free and hurled themselves with vice to cleanse the solid world from me, who stood behind perception's bars as if it were a judgment from the stars searing through my icy prison bars. Yes, we know about that time. A violent illness of the inner ear, a post-viral depression, and the doctor warned you that you might be at risk of extreme permanent seasickness. So off you went to try yourself out on the Lowestoft sailing trawler Excelsior, across the North Sea at Easter. You never said you'd kept a log of that trip. Excelsior 2000. My bunk is on top of some important bloke's bunk, so I had better keep my annoying personal habits to a minimum. The Dutch guy with the grey hair and moustaches, Harry. The real name of the bosun is Ben. Ben the bosun. Next to my bunk is a fire bell, which you have to turn to operate. This ensures that you will be deafened as well as burned.、Uh, Tuesday, we were joined by a racing pigeon today. It still has not left, and I don't think it intends to. It was badly dehydrated and its shit was green, so we gave it some water and some oatmeal, and it perked up. Wednesday, o four hundred started watch. O five hundred, wind got up and some light appeared. O six hundred, wind died down again. The stupid pigeon drowned at about o five thirty. It tried to fly away. But it was not strong enough, so it tried to fly back to the boat. It missed by about a meter and 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 fell into the water. All we have to remember it by is the shit which it left everywhere. A seasickness, thank goodness, didn't happen. So you got on the tall ship's race that you'd longed for, crossing the Atlantic on the Dutch ship Europa. We had our fingers crossed for a month. Then you rang from the top of the mast on the finishing line, and told us that you were made watch leader after the first gale. Going aloft is to me a magical experience of which I do not believe I will ever tire. On the way up, you are encapsulated in a world of rope, tar, and billowing sails. Height is not an issue since the distance travelled is less important than the overtarred rung in which foot must be jammed. Every rattling shroud and futter contains the fear, relief, and exultation of everybody who has climbed it. You are ascending through the clouds, through your own effort, not the will of any power or God. Yourself, in control and washed clean of identity, association. The mind is drawn to the climb through the jungle of rigging. But then it was back to ordinary life and school. A levels. Wooden eyes, biting skin, pinprick skies, void within. Purple haze, fiery drops, evil maze, burnt-out cops, growing thoughts, winding stalks, nightmares fought, rotting corpse, caffeine storm, beating brain, pure heart torn, torn again. Hish, just as well I'm remembering as well as reading. Moods like that weren't full time with you, but yes, we could see by then that you'd outgrown school life. You'd seen something else out there in the Atlantic, up that mast. All I know about truth is its absence in youth. We see others, but we do not look. We are the empty pages of a ruined book, the shiny celebration of self. Through clothes and unearned wealth and comfort sweet and sickly honey, we celebrate being slaves to money. We do not know what we are for, so we fight youth's hopeless war. C of E, the church, the charms, the chanting psalms. Perhaps the church has missed the strength of every living God in every atheist. Friday, July the sixth, and so it is that time of year again, to go to sea for better or for worse, where silver sails break sun in golden shards, and I can work at being pure again.
You'd loved Europa, but you chose a different ship for the next tall ship's race, the Norwegian Christian Radi. Another logbook, I see. The wind blew up to a force six or seven. Looking upwards from under the main mast, I could see that the main royal was yet to be stowed. At 2300, I found myself volunteering to climb. I had made it. Now to do the job. My imagination was racing, headlines entering my head like arrows as I became conscious of only wearing a rope around my waist for safety. Everybody works slowly and steadily, driven by adrenaline and necessity. After a certain point, adrenaline stops pumping through the veins. It is replaced by pure life. I am open to the sky and can look down upon the ship as a soul in heaven looks down upon the earth. Through jungles of complication and stress to the open sea and sky, every thought wiped clean, every emotion intensified, every colour brighter. Through most of the night, the sun was up. The sky was clouded over but for dim shapes of light on the windward side. It was as if God was watching us and the remote flicker of the sun on the water extended a tiny thread to protect us all. God was to windward, watching from where we all should be. <sighs> Again, we had no idea you wrote a log on that trip. But the great thing was that school was over at last. Bring on the gap year. Stage one. Earn some money for your travels. I was a waiter. I grinned, sweated and apologised my way through four months in the Wentworth Hotel Aldborough. I suppose in an office there is relatively little harm in looking bemused and vague when you are new. As a waiter, however... I was instructed to appear confident and collected when amongst the guests. I therefore strode in and out of broom cupboards and bedrooms, always trying to look businesslike and knowledgeable. One thing that startled me on my first day was how much many of the guests resembled their food. The similarity became striking. Uh, an old, stout, poached pear was calling me to bring coffee. Two half-lobsters dressed in pink required their main course, while a rare Angus steak boomed to his bored colleagues, flushing in his red wine sauce. It was strange that until I had worked in the hotel for about a month, I never really looked at my surroundings. I suppose that I was too preoccupied with simply keeping up, so that I never noticed what a beautiful place it was. I, re I remember clearly one breakfast time on a Sunday... It had been dark when I arrived at 06.30, as I was waiting for the first guests just after sunrise. Rays of sunlight fell through the windows, sparkling in the glasses and throwing patterns of light onto the carpet. The whole restaurant seemed to glow against the blue line of the barely visible sea. The tapestries on the walls looked as if a little life had been breathed into them. They became much more than a collection of stitches... They had energy, vibrancy and a loveliness which took my breath away. The sun rose a little higher, scattering light around the room. Had I fallen asleep, or was time moving slightly differently for me than for everybody else? The coffee inside me gave me a warm feeling, subduing active thoughts for a few magic minutes. For some reason, this one... Outwardly insignificant morning is the dominating memory of my time as a waiter. It was an honest but risky thing to have a second go for St Catherine's College, Oxford. Your headmaster, frankly, thought it was nuts. But it worked, you got in, and by Christmas the way was clear ahead. Christmas and New Year fled past in their cosy domestic way. Dark corners of rooms shone with tinsel, firelight danced along it. I felt wrapped in a blanket of homeliness. Last year I had no university place, no upcoming adventure, and a heap of A-level work to complete. This year I had my place at the University of My Dreams and a huge adventure to come. Yes, a very big adventure. 
because even more selective than Oxford was Captain Class Gastra of Europa, who took you on as a deckhand for six months, from Costa Rica to Micronesia, Japan, and Korea. I suppose that for all parents, this is the time when the mystery of a son's inner life grows even more opaque. Nervous uneasiness grew inside me as the time for departure approached. A strange rope seemed to be binding me to my home, and I even dreamt that I went away from home and returned to find my family dead and burnt. In cheerful moments, packing was fun. As I laid up various gadgets, knives, torches, and so on, my imagination wandered over the times that I might need them. I imagined daring situations aloft where a pocket knife could be invaluable. As with many episodes in my life, I allowed a hazy, often feeble fantasy to take the place of reality, which was watching me like a vulture. The truth is, I was afraid. I was afraid to change my surroundings or change myself. How might I return from my travels? Would I hate the books which had served as my friends? Would I despise my university? Oh, heaven help the mind that's flexible! He flew out from Heathrow Terminal Four with his backpack, and I remember getting the email from Costa Rica. Dear Mum, I hope that everything at home is all right. I am quite looking forward to the first month and a half, but I have my doubts about going all the way to Nagasaki. I'm afraid that the whole crossing may be a bit too much for me. Whatever this makes me, so be it. I will give it a fair try, however, until Hawaii. All my love, Nick. A silent month and a half went by, and then there was another email from Hawaii. Hi, Dad. I have arrived in Hawaii and have had a great time on passage. I have found out that I have the wrong type of visa, and the authorities say that I cannot leave the ship. Oh well, <laughs> they can't have their own way all the time. I, I, I should be okay so long as I stay out of trouble. The only drawback is that、uh, I can't use my passport to cash travellers' checks. It is safer locked up in the ship where they can't see it. Anyway, I am having a great time, and we'll be in contact somehow. All that spring, we followed the ship's satellite track, and as for you, working fifteen hours a day, it now turns out that you somehow found time to write. So I have now been on Europa since January the ninth, just over forty days. Thoughts of home are slowly vanishing, and I am able to enjoy the experience. From sunset to sunrise. A sustaining energy seems to run through the ship. People are always awake, always working. As each day passes, I become sensible of a stronger emotion, an emotion forged by a small group on an inexplicably large ocean. It crushes and redeems in a way I never knew was possible. In a stolen moment, I found myself gazing at the silver trail of the moon. It danced upon the ocean's infinite and mysterious depths. I began to wonder if it was a silver shaft of heaven that I saw, diluted in the waters of the world, so that mortal man could gaze upon a fragment of the divine majesty. I then turned to the dazzling moon itself, that I might see a clearer view of something perfect and austere. Through sleepy eyes, I watched its sullen gaze. Until there came a moment of release, and every crater glowed infinitely brighter. It was as if the moon was giving up the secrets which it had held for all time. The corona shone so brightly that there appeared an eye, which gazed into recesses of my soul. Beyond ideals and the restrictions of metaphysics, knowledge of the all-consuming truths frightened me, and I wept. That night, I slept under the stars and woke to see great cloud mountains on the horizon, silver and devastating. Oh, gallop on, wild horses of the night, for even you may glimpse eternal light.
7th. Overcast skies roll us onward to Pompeii. In the Pacific trade winds, a sailor will often talk about the slipping by of time, how two days seem to turn into twenty without any conscious interval. The days are punctuated by blazing skies, feathery pink at sunrise, and vividly fiery in the evening. The ship becomes like a like a metronome which has been attached to a human heart. The helmsman's hands cannot correct the course and the ship sways more violently, straining alternately at the rigging to port and starboard. The crew conform to the rhythms of seconds, watches, days and passages with a huge sense of well-being. Many of my shipmates have vivid dreams of navigating the ship through city streets. My dreams have become too vivid. I dream of islands where the dead go to watch angels die. Lying on deck at night, watching the stars roll in and out from under the sails, I could not help feeling infinitely small, yet in such good company. The first indication that our voyage was ending was a mass of grey cloud in the sky. I had been up since four, carrying out routine maintenance, thoughtfully, with the spectre of land in my mind. As the sun rose, it it split the sky, a seam of gold through the cloud, making the island look somehow unreal. Drowsily, we all looked at the shadow land, hot cups of coffee melting into our hands, anticipating ends and beginnings. Pompeii is a distant port, the least lonely nowhere in the world, a port through which all manner of ships passed on their journey between the superpowers. If you journey into the jungles, as we did, there are ancient ruins among the swampy rivers, created by the old superpowers who must have moved tons and tons of stone to build a jungle city. I asked a young child how it was believed that the stones got there. He gave an answer, more sensible than my question, that they flew there by magic. On the final night in port, I was not company. Some of the crew who had become dearest to me were leaving, and we were to change captains. I walked alone and heard the barking of dogs, subdued by day and enlivened in the tropical night. I felt inhuman, recessed into the same darkness which made the chained dogs growl and grind their fangs as I passed. We knew nothing of all this intensity. How could we? Why should we? But here's your email home from Pompeii, still on my computer. Hi, Mum. I'm afraid that having crossed the date line and gone through yet another time zone, dates and times have become meaningless, so it'll be difficult to phone you. But never mind, the passage went well with pretty good winds all the way. I'm definitely on until Nagasaki, unless they throw me off the ship. I hope everything at home is all right, but but if anything is not, you must, must, must tell me. Pompeii is a pleasant place, which has 300 days of rainfall per year. We went swimming in a waterfall and to see some ancient ruins, chewed beetle nut and scrubbed rust off the hull. Love, Nick. It all sounded good to us back home. But back to the grubby logbook now. It's so fluent and so rapidly written, I I suppose there wasn't time to rewrite or even cross anything out. Pompeii vanished into the light rainy mists like a half-retrieved memory. I am a fool. I have set myself up for a fall from love and innocence. We too, like horses on the waves, ran through the canyon's blue. And all that lonesome sailors crave was running round with you. The Pacific Ocean is the least lonely place on earth. Birds land on deck. Whales and dolphins have accompanied us. And in such good company, loneliness seems a mere figment of the land. To look upon an empty sea and say that it is empty is not to look on it at all. As the squalls roll on past us, we feel truly like a part of the ocean. 17th. 
I am low, in a dip, so to speak. We have just caught a baby Dorado and they decided to kill it. The biggest challenge is, is not letting my dip affect others. By being glad in their company, I am achieving this. Every time a surge of bad emotions comes, I think of angels and try to wash the feeling away. Not suppress it, but purge it completely. 18th. We are at Nomwin Island. The water is flat and a pleasant breeze is flowing over the ship, making sleep a positive joy. Having been ashore, I hold a place in my heart for such an island. The warmth of human spirit everywhere sometimes overwhelms me. Every object makes a voyage. Every person infinitely complex, if only one could see. The spirit which continues our race, the spirit which founded Rome and realised how unimportant it is, was in the air, and, and every hopeful eye I see. If I could spread the wings of my spirit and become a sunrise and hang over all of the earth, where there is no heart to swell with love, but only beauty to absorb it, I would be content. Nineteenth. Yesterday was again spent at the atoll. I had a dip in the morning, largely due to exhaustion. In my fatigue I painted the mizzen top and moused it, returning to deck when my arms burnt inwardly and outwardly. I went to shore in a foul mood, hoping only to stretch my legs. Oh, the afternoon was more wonderful than I ever could have hoped. I played with the children all afternoon and ate coconut. Myself, Rick, Erica and John played volleyball against the islanders. On returning to the ship on a high, I dipped after a certain conversation, memorable only to myself. I prayed upon the rising crescent moon that I would not survive another night. I woke in tears and fed upon the deadliest of loves. 22nd. Nomwin Island gave me a glimpse of redemption. The flatness of the atoll gives it a beautiful vulnerability, almost as fragile as the way of life it supports. One man told me that the world was ending. I also found out from him that he had never been further than Yap. I suppose that if your world is infinitely small, the ending is easy to contemplate. When a storm could destroy the fragile balance, the end is an easier concept to handle. What will I do after this? Can I bear to go home? Where is home? If home is where the heart is, I shall never reach it, for my heart is in all around. Everything and nothing possesses it. In April, at Terminal 5, you reappeared, and we didn't recognise you. Leaner, dark-skinned, curly hair down to your shoulders. The doctor on the ship had suggested a fortnight's rest at home. But you were due back on the ship. Europa was booked to join the Sail Korea celebrations, training and meeting young South Koreans. Boarding Europa at about 7 o'clock, I quickly stowed my luggage in the crew cave, which was 35 degrees and looked as if a bomb had hit it. A foam mattress lay on the floor, shoes and towels spilt out of bags, and the usual assortment of unwanted junk was festooned on the bunks. I noticed that the bin had not been emptied since I left. My discarded jeans still lay there, like trashy guardians of time linking my two experiences. I saw the Koreans boarding the ship, cameras out. Marianne and Jenny had prepared some food, and I hope that they felt welcome. I well remember how I was on coming aboard a strange ship, and how welcome I was made. Despite my tiredness, I tried to be cheerful and welcome them in the same friendly way. After another short walk, I found myself very ready to crash into a graceless repose. Remember, it was a hot day, and the ventilation for the crew cave is, for some reason, buried deep inside a locker. A friend of mine once described tropical sleeping conditions on Europa 
as like sleeping in a dog's mouth. I felt this description to be worthy of poetry. At about 1100, Ray New, crew member and Europa office guru, asked me to lend a hand with some basic training aloft for the young Koreans. I enjoy taking people aloft for the first time. The raw thrill, which I feel as only a background noise now, was present in them as they clambered around the main, waving to their friends below. I appreciated this, and some of that pioneering feeling returned to me. The rigging became vibrant and challenging as it had been when I first sailed on Europa in the summer of 2000. Thirteenth. I kept on waking up and seeing a shadowy figure standing over my bed. So vivid sometimes that I almost addressed it. Sometimes the figure seemed behind me or beside me during the day. I wonder who it is and what he has in mind for me. Fourteenth. So, whose day begins at midnight with the task of telling young Koreans how to clean out a toilet? Mine does. I, I dreamt last night of diseases and woke firmly believing that I was covered in toxic spores. I could not breathe. The obvious solution came to me. I had to jump into the water, thus washing the spores off. Then, once underwater, I could breathe again. I reached the companionway steps, thankfully unseen, in just my boxer shorts, before I realised that it was a dream. I promptly went back to bed, and before long began to realise that it was not a dream. However, waking rationality had diluted the fantasy, and I only believed that I would be ill if I inhaled. People were shouting at me, accusing me of deeds which I did not know that I had committed. I woke to see the dark figure standing by me again. At about 5.30, I became conscious of the ship suddenly keeling over at a far greater angle than before. Emerging on deck was one of life's wild moments. I could, I could feel the rising wind and see drops of water being broken loose from the surface of the sea as we crashed down the rising waves, ludicrously overpowered. The lazy to and fro of slack ropes had become a struggling thrash. The question must have arisen in all our minds, when will it stop? When will the wind stop rising? As feet felt for the foot ropes and nervous hands clutched the yard arms high above the deck, class became like the conductor of an orchestra, modifying the discordant rhythms of Europa into a harmony with the wild and barren sea. The missed footing or unsecured line had an enhanced and deathly significance. When I got off watch, I tried to get some sleep. Anxiety, combined with the motion of the ship, made it impossible. The next watch was a busy one. Damage had to be repaired, sails set and furled again when the wind rose. I seemed to end up with a thousand small tasks to complete and no time at all. All the guys on board say, Nick looks like a baby but he works all the time. 17th. Today, I unwrapped sugar cubes for two hours. The ship has on board only individually wrapped sugar cubes, and they all must be unwrapped. This job I find too insulting for trainees, who are on board for only a brief period of time, and I drifted away in thought while eight cubes per minute fell, unpacked, into the large tub. 18th. We crossed the finish line about two o'clock, the sun came out for the first time in a week, and some of us went out in the sloopy to take photographs. I had never seen the ship looking so utterly beautiful. In the dimming light, the sails took on a gold-tinged aspect as the hull cut through the water, smoothly sailing to her anchorage. I felt in that time that perhaps I was in the right place for that moment. 
some of the misery of the past few days was washed away as I, I watched the ship on which I had crossed two oceans making her stately way onwards. Such strength and such peace perfectly combined. A feeling of content spread to all on board as we made our way towards the welcoming arms of Incheon. The Korean trainees took us out to eat. We were induced to drink many shots, I counted 15, of a distilled rice wine called soju. This had the effect of blurring everything, making time and food slip by. Everything was delicious. We sang, we drank, we smoked. I was, being English, invited to play soccer against the Russian cadets. I was disgustingly drunk and barefoot. The Russians were icily sober and wearing combat boots. I remember as the ball scudded towards me over the ground and made contact with my feet. My swimming head sent me toppling over and I half walked, half crawled back to my ship. We were happy sailors. Back in England. The moon marked time. The lamps were raining an orange sea of gases and grime in rancid waves to welcome me. Paper shells like claws kicked through old streets, an empty can, a bullet cartridge falls to ground, and all but one can hear that sound. The moon keeps time still underneath the sea, and England spreads its streets to welcome me. Ah. Oh. A long morning's reading and a voyage completed. And I shake myself and look around, puzzled to find myself in a silent summer garden. I see that the rest of that notebook of your Pacific Odyssey is taken up with drafts for a pre-Oxford essay on Browning's The Ring and the Book. After this, it all seems to be poems, scribbled in between university essays. The dean takes his place in the opulent hall, face rhinoceros grey. We tune our ears for the Latin exchange. The sun looks in, without intention, meaning as much as a starter's gun on 500 faces expecting to change. Such radiant hope on a meaningless stage forms the word matriculation. But not yet gone two years ago, I cried as if I was the less being denied the dreaming day of champagne mixed with pride. Sunlight injured my eyes. The windows gave an oceanic feel. The statue's robes channeled the breeze outside and rose and fell in the aftermath of a long invitation, the words of which are simply isolation. The sea thickens in the coral dell as the divers descend where the stonefish dwell. The light splits in shafts as the darkness swells and creatures desert the fatal well. Death eats colour in a diving hell, dark since the time that man first fell. Look into the mirror, love, and see your blue eyes burning, burning, and think that in one mind, my love, the blue fires burn on, yearning. The colours that played swift around the world while you were speaking have fallen, tarnished to the ground, and strew around my grieving. The silver sails sliced through the air, while twilight skies glowed with desire. But time's short course has dulled love's colours, and old visions are expiring. Visions are expiring. Three years at Oxford, and then it was Liverpool and a postgraduate degree. But after two terms, you gave that one up pretty sharply. How do you justify literary criticism as an industry? Too much bad writing has been written about good writing, and it is ruining English as a subject, reducing it to a weird network of theory. A good writer can learn more from looking out of the window than some can by travelling the world. The weeks after this were strange. You were in a fit of depression, which you'd dealt with before. 
You weren't in denial. You acknowledged your fragile mental state. Does believing that I'm sick make me more sick or less sick? Every life is a tragedy. Our end is inevitable from the very moment that our characters emerge, and the thrill of the thing is not in the end itself, but in the route we take to reaching that end. Our deaths do not so much represent the end of our character, but the completion of our character. There is nothing more to know about ourselves, but the tragic formula is complete. It is the perfect moment which one may call heaven. You had plans, sensible plans. You did that internship at the National Theatre where they loved you. You thought about studying Jungian theory and made some very good jokes. Yet an impalpable unease was hanging in the air. We felt like animals before a thunderstorm. The soul is the river which flows along the valley. If God exists, He is the sun, casting not only light but shadow. When asking God to shine on us, we must accept the shadows. I fully accept that I am the battlefield for heaven and hell more than most. I seek not for resolution, since I am the resolution. I have become the human battlefield for good and evil. Nicholas Heine, the 23-year-old son of journalists Libby Purvis and Paul Heine, has been found dead at the family home in Suffolk. The family say he was being treated for depression. We knew that you were increasingly fragile. You were offered professional help, and you accepted it. But nobody expected suicide. Really not. Through those summer mornings afterwards, I transcribed every word, using a different font to my normal one, so that there was no temptation to change a single comma. And there we left it for a few months. Your writings, neatly typed out. Never meant to publish, but your tutor Duncan Wu read it and persuaded us we had to. He said that yours was a voice worth hearing, a song needing to be sung. I sing inside myself, the one wild song, song that whirls my words around until a world unfurls my ship's new sail. I catch the dew and set a course amongst the ocean curls. And another year goes by, and we try to come to terms with why you left us, just as you always slipped away after those long Sunday lunches. Your uncle put it best. He said, "Well, he stayed as long as he could, but the room had to be sorted out, and I couldn't get that damn wooden filing cabinet out of the door easily. So I took an axe to it, and out of it, trapped behind a drawer, too late for the book, fluttered this: a poem about writing a poem. I have an idea, a fear. Let me craft it." Let me give it shape, and let it be terrible. I must feed it noise, give it voice. Let it be a symphony of forms and fears, and let it strike tonight. It will be the wake of great craft. Oh, let me hold it, give me cause, let me control it. Recapture the dead, a mere thread, delicate and slight. Let it remain, and let it be brighter than its paper stain. In the silence of the song's end, by Nicholas Heine, adapted for radio by Libby Purvis, Nick was played by Joseph Drake. And young Nick, Luca Thomas, the narrator was Libby Purvis. Sound design was by David Thomas, and the producer was Karen Rose. The Silence at the Song's End is a Sweet Talk production for BBC Radio Four.